Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session that is titled Collaborative Writing in Religious Education. Of course, as good religious educators, we're going to take the prompt and run with it however we want to, right? And that's the case of our three wonderful presenters who've accepted our invitation for this session. My name is Mayan Tran. I uh, serve on the Publications Committee that is chaired by Hosman Osbino at uh, Boston College. And um, the committee also includes the editor of our journal, Religious Education, Dr. Joyce Mercer of Yale Divinity School. I currently um, am part of the co-editorial team um, with Hosman and Boyoung Lee um, for the Horizons book series of the REA. All right. So I will introduce our speakers, our three speakers, one at a time before they speak. They will each speak for about 15 minutes, and then we'll kind of have a time for us to connect, to, to integrate, to pause, to think about questions, and then invite you in. All right. Without further ado, let me um, introduce you to our first speaker. Muala Salchuk is the first Muslim president of the REA. 2018, can you imagine, right? Muella has a voice of encounter that shines through in all of her collaborative projects. Among them are three, the Dictionary of Encounter, Basic Terms of Christianity and Islam, a clear and authentic example of acquaintanceship and understanding between Christianity and Islam. Another project is an anthropological project, Human Being in Christianity and Islam. Another one is an Isl Islamic worldview project, Religion in a Modern, Secular, and Dem Democratic State. She is the holder of the Order of Merit of Germany, awardee of honorary doctorate by the University of Lucerne in Switzerland, and is a founder, one of the founders of the Resilient Classes Movement. And she's cur currently training religious teachers in Turkey for an ethic of encounter. On a personal note, Moala teaches me how to be a better person every time I get to encounter her. So without further ado, Moala. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. And I greet you all wholeheartedly from Istanbul. And I thank you, Maya, for introducing me from academic part. And now I am busy as a grandmother and with my newborn granddaughter. So I want to share it with you and, and ask for, for prayers. Uh, my, may I, uh, Denise, may I share my screen? Yes, please, please do what you need to do there. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Share. Thank you. I am I am blessed and I'm really grateful uh, to having me uh, this gathering. I'm going to present on the subject of learning in encounter and collaborative writing. The relationship between establishing a culture of encounter and writing together. So under some of my collaborative projects, I would like to share my experience with you. The first project would be, it's just finished. This is a European uh, project with eight universities, eight European universities. One of them is my university, uh, University, and from Heidelberg, from Greece, uh, from Vienna, and we have more other associate universities and some uh, schools. This, this project aimed to um, encourage respectful encounters between diverse religious, secular, collective, or individual worldviews. It provided teaching materials for school and universities and international qualification course for students to prepare uh, for gen uh, future generation for peaceful co coexistence. Um, yeah, and I, you, you are all welcome to enroll because it's free. It's one half year education, mainly for teachers. Uh, it offers additional qualification. What is this additional qualification? It is a certificate which 
focus on practical and theoretical part of building culture of encounter. That is the main question in this project is how to engage people from different worldviews, secular, cultural, religious worldviews. As you all know that everyone has a worldview and our worldview shapes our way of looking at life and engaging people and even our way of collaborating and writing. You see on the on screen, each partner contributes to this to this project by their own worldview, by their own worldview. Um, they, we, we, we collaborate, just, just I want to give you the structure first. The stru structure was every partner wrote their piece and they, they were under review with, with the peers. And then they, they came to the executive committee and it turned to product. You see this uh, climate, for example, the climate um, issue from Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Jew, Islamic, and ethics. This is the structure, but I want to draw your, your attention to another point. Um, you, you may have different structure in, in writing collaborative, collaboratively. Either you can uh, make it one for all, or it's, it's a sequences, or just come together and all the partner engage with all the parts and all these kind of technical things. But for th those are technical things. The important things, what I learned from this project and for the, from the other project I want to share with you is to build a culture of encounter. What I mean by that, it, it, is um, some way of dealing with each other in order to um, come together, work together, and uh, produce our, our work uh, all uh, in safe, let, let, let's say, because writing by ourselves is safer. Um, we know at least what to do and what will be the result. But when we come together, we worry about the, the result. Would it be a success? Would it be a failure? Or would it be something in between? So th that's why I uh, this project focused mainly on the habit of encounters. That when we develop habits of encounters, that uh, we, we become more collaborative, and we develop our uh, way of working together. Um, I worked as a coordinator, as an author in some projects, but you know, all you know, we have very pushy people, there are dominant personalities, there are underachievers, overachievers, enthusiastic people like me, but resistors, there are resistors. And how to come together and collaborate. This is the important thing because collaboration is taking a risk. And that's why uh, I bring this topic to uh, what we call it encounter learning. The, this we can share ways that help us understand the meaning of the different and to calm our fears, foster our hopes, and uh, I, I can say that. Um, people who have these skills of encounter, they become more uh, productive in collaborative writing. And they, they, they are happy when they, when they work together. This is the most project I want to share with you, but I have two more just to share my experience um, more and to deepen the, the discussion with you. And uh, this is the Dictionary of Encounter project. This is a seven year work uh, project and uh, it, it took it brought German and Turkish colleagues together. What happened uh, in this project? Uh, around 300 
around uh, 300 words, um, concepts were defined by Muslims and by Christians. Each they defined their, their concepts. It's called actually the dictionary of dialogue as well. Uh, in, the, in this project, um, I, I took some, some notes when I was preparing for this session, and I thought that much taken has taken place throughout these seven years. We began our journey in an official man manner, and as a scholar, we strongly defended our own positions first. But the things changed over years, and we began to understand, appreciate, and value each other's views. We became college and friends, and in essence, we achieved what is at the heart of encounter, knowledge and deeper respect of self and other. So this is the gain of coming together for encounter. We get knowledge, yes, and also deeper respect of self and others. In numerous meetings had between Muslim and Christians, editors, several points emerged that shaped our dialogue. And insight was shown in letting go of centuries old intellectual biases and embracing the process of working together as a movement of grace. The powerful effect of being open to correction by the other was evident. The capability of respecting each other's position rather than privileging one's own tradition increased. In the light of this dialogue process, it became open that we should be prepared to engage in an honest, self-reflective critic of the use of our monolithic discourses. Our dialogue certainly was not always one of union uh, harmony or even complementary, but could at times induce much tension as well. As a matter of fact, uh, yeah, in every interaction, in every interaction, most understanding and misunderstandings were inter intertwined. But being fully present and listening attentively, being mutually critical, critical kept the culture of encounter alive. This is my impression from one of my projects. And I want to share with you one more. This is an Islamic worldview project. It's called Religion in Modern, Secular, and Democratic Society. Uh, this is really a very interesting project because it started with an encounter. In Ottawa in 2010, I met John Bolt from Canada, from Braunschweig University. He was, uh, he, he, he created an approach, as a very specific approach of mapping a, a, any, any culture or any religion worldview. It was for me very interesting. I invited him uh, to Ankara, to Turkey, and it took seven years with five workshops with 18 scholars. At, every, at uh, almost every level, a professor, young researchers, and from different subjects. What, what we did, John is a Christian. We, were, we are Muslims. John asked provocative questions, I can say to us. And we started reflecting on our own tradition again with new eyes. And the, at the end, after very intense discussion, very, very hard and intense discussion among our scholars. We, we created the draft and uh, circulated the draft to each other. And then because of, of, the, of the language obstacle, we discussed in Turkish and John was so patient to listen to us even he, he, he doesn't know one word, but he listened to us. We discussed we answered his question, a, a Christian asked question to Muslims and Muslims trying to explore their faith again, again with new eyes under these questions. After we brought the draft from each of our colleagues, then the three editors of the book came together and refined the, the draft and sent it again to our colleagues and the book came, came out. So in this point, the book brought insight from a group of academics, younger and older in Turkey, from multiple perspectives that include 
theological, philosophical, historical, cultural, sociological, and more, which is particular to the process of writing together at different, completely different from publishing individually. This particularly important step that all the team members agree on the elements of the project. This needs careful communication, drafting, revising, and editing. You may find different te techniques, but for me, is the important thing is to establish, establish a culture of encounter. Coming towards to my to the end of my presentation, I want to share with you three R's for the relationship between encounter learning and collaborative writing. The holding, I hold the conviction that collaborative writing requires reflective, responsible, and respectable relationship. These three, three build, build, build the grounding, and then other techniques can come uh, to the fore. So what I mean by being responsible or reflective or respectful, I'm really very happy to uh, answer your question if you are interested. But the important things, I think, uh, we live in different parts of the world, as now we came together, we share a common hope. And here we came together to think, to feel, to communicate, and write in hope to find ways beyond our individual positions and paths toward a kind and a more just future. So this, this was my aim of uh, and the motivation behind my, my project. And these three concepts helped me uh, to build the grounding in, in every project, become responsible, become re reflective, and become respectful to uh, each other. Of course, we can depend on this, but uh, I think, yeah, for me, I'm not sure, but I think the time uh, is over. So I would like to thank you very, very much for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to share about some of my project and the way I collaborate different culture, religions, and world views. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Muala. As you stop sharing your screen, I invite those of us who are in this Zoom room to express our appreciation to Muala in some way, either through an emoji or um, through your, uh, your visual cue, <laughs> your body language. Um, we will have lots of time later on to engage one another. But as I hear it, um, Muala and take notes, it, it occurred to me that I should invite us all to reflect on um, on the purpose of this session as colleagues of the Publications Committee and I were thinking about the topic for this session, we wanted to do at least three things. One is to showcase creative collaborative projects within religious education and REA. We wanted to give participants an opportunity to make connections to resources and sources for your future collaborations. But we also want to invite everybody to think about the nature of collaboration within religious education scholarship and within academic scholarship in general. And Moala's reflections have broached uh, some of that already. So I invite you to be thinking about questions for our presenters along those lines. With that, I introduce to you our second speaker, who's also another past president of the REA. Dr. Bert Robin is a professor of religious education in the Faculty of Catholic Theology at the University of Bonn in Germany. He taught previously, previously in Belgium and the Netherlands. Bert served, uh, served as president of the Religious Education Association in 2017 and currently is the president of the European Forum for Teachers of Religious Education. Bert was recently appointed as extraordinary professor at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. He has published widely in the fields of religious education, moral education, practical theology, and public theology. With that, the mic is yours, Brent. Thank you very much, Mayan, for this for this introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to me, it's an honor to me to be in this beautiful um, open learning space and to be uh, with you here, uh, sitting at this side of the of the PC or the 
laptop uh, in Belgium for the moment and talking to you, uh, let me say, at the other side of the pond and all over the world. So it's always beautiful to sit together in a Zoom meeting in that respect. So I feel very honored to talk about this interesting topic of collaborative writing. Um, the word collaborative is is, is, is so, um, so interesting to think about. There's a beautiful book Actually, it's online. You can you can read it online by Henk de Roost, Collaborative Practical Theology. I like that book very much. It's a it's an it's an online book that he wrote two three years ago, in which he um, he puts puts forth the idea that that every every work in practical theology should be collaborative, should be um, participative. And I like that idea, that, that very, very, very idea that we need to work together. I, at least that's that's one of the main things I always try to, to, to make clear to my students uh, in religious education, this effort or in, in practical theology or in public theology or in lived theology, it's always about collaboration. It's always about working together. So if we find this important for our students and for our audiences and for the people we work with uh, participatively, yes, we also need to think about how we can do this academically. We need, like Muella also said, we need to write or to work on a culture of encounter. I, I fully agree with her in that respect. So the point is, if we want to do this academically, we need also to find ways to do that academically. I would like to present you two uh, examples of my collaborative work in writing. Yes, one is uh, uh, based in the uh, larger research project on international knowledge transfer in religious education. Uh, I will put the link uh, here um, on the in the chat box. Um, you can check it there if you want. It's an international uh, project on sharing uh, knowledge in re in europe it's mainly european yes and we wrote this book together it's the second book uh, in this in this row of uh, international knowledge transfer in re you can you can read it also online so it's it's also open source uh, available uh, in which we uh, let me say we we bring together knowledge in re in europe empirical hermeneutical but also didactical educational knowledge in europe we bring this together and trying to learn from each other. I like this 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 project very much because it really focuses on on novel on knowledge that travels around. I think that knowledge should travel around, and especially in an, in a space in which we more and more are um, are working with with open source materials. We could really learn from each other a lot. So we need to find ways to to broaden that that sort of work i think what we did in that second book which was based on preparing future teachers for religious education you all know that in europe mainly in all countries except from albania and france religious education is a topic in public schools yes so re religion and religious diversity is thematized is articulated articulated in public schools in the public sphere which i think is a very good thing it's really a, a blessing that we can we can do that in a way yes um it, we all felt in that in in the in, in the pandemic really that we were all together in europe in the same boat not only in europe i mean this is was a global experience eh? or even in the same storm you could say so what was this storm all about and how did this storm affected our work in re that was actually the focus that emerged from our conversation yes we met twice in berlin we met uh in vienna uh uh, we met also digitally in Bonn at my university, but that's one of the topics that that emerged, so to say, out of our work. What happened with young people in schools, in classes, in in the public sphere uh, during the pandemic, and how does this, how did the pandemic affected our work in religious education? So the the topic of that communal um, challenge and that communal work that we did together arose really out of of a, of, a, of a really of a crisis experience. Um, we so we wrote those we wrote that that book together yes and one step beyond in that same project I invited and I think this is very important I invited three of my 
uh, research uh, fellows or three of my doctoral students within that project in that writing process so you can see it also when you look closer to the to the table of contents that three of my doctoral students were invited also in that process of writing so they were in the same boat we were all in the same boat what ha what do, did they have to 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 bring to the table of learning you could say from their perspective so we we talked about about the crisis experience, we, we we talked together, the four of us, me and the three doctoral students, about how this crisis was affecting their work in, in schools and in the public sphere and in their research. And uh, that, that we, we really brought nice things together. It was all about dealing with crisis, dealing with the role of the teacher within the crisis, the one who is between worlds, you could say, uh, the wounded healer, uh, using the words of Carl Gustav Jung or, uh, or other authors, the, what could that be? And we found out that that a lot of autoethnographic work ne needed to be done. Yeah? So I think that autoethnographic work in that respect was very helpful for ourselves to understand where we were and how we could then learn from each other. The learning process with the four of us was amazing, actually. So we were on the same, we were on the same, we sat in the same boat in the same storm, but we also were, let me say, equally uh, and in, in equi equity, we're working together as a professor and three doctoral uh, researchers. So working on the same topic. That was an, I think this is important. I really believe this is important that we take along our doctoral students with us in the writing. So we just invite them, come and join me in writing. Yeah. So my name can be um, uh, on, on the first position, but my name can also be on the last position. It depends. Yes. You know what I mean? So in the, in the, it's, it's, I don't have to defend anything anymore. I'm, I'm a full professor. Yes. <laughs> but I can have, I can, I can have, I can offer my students the blessed opportunity to be co-writers with me. You see? So, and, and mainly we work, um, um, so we work together in that respect and we and we learn from each other. It's always a, let me say, an organic process. It's in the writing and in the learning and in the discussion that, that, that topics arise and that we can divide the work and then learn together in finding out what is the topic, well, how can we focus on that from our different fields, and then how we can we come to conclusions that bring us together. I also did this together with two postdocs for this for this. Uh, uh, for this RA, uh, our Religious Education Association uh, meeting on 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 uh, on on the Earth experience, uh, we we wrote a paper together in in the uh, Religious Education uh, Journal um, that that um, prepared this 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 uh, session of the of the of the conference. That's one that's one thing. Uh, so you could say this is. Um, bringing together both both best of both worlds. That's the innov in innovative elements that bring in those doctoral students. That's one thing, and that's other at the other hand the expertise that I can offer them in in in, in contextualizing and in 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 helping them to 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 bring things together. I think it's context is important, and 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 theoretical schemes in which we work together is important. That brings me to the second project, which is I would call uh, I will also briefly. I put this into the chat um, box here, which is uh, just a, a link to another project that we're working on for the moment, which is the, called the Chapter Project, Children as Participants in Theological Research. So we believe really that children not only are good theologians and little theologians and, 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 and uh, not just pocket theologians, but really, really full-fledged theologians, but they also can help us in raising good theological questions. So they can help us also in theological research. That's one step beyond, so to say. And in that respect, we we, we built a an international project in which we invited scholars from all over the world who are involved in the work with young, with, with young children. Children, uh, I mean, not the youngest one, but uh, around the age of 10, 12, uh, also to uh, to find out what is the local situation of, of children in these countries and how do they relate also again to to crisis situations we we can't we can't go on and we all know this of course from all sides of the world from all every corner of the world we can't go on anymore let me say by doing as if there's nothing happening in the world yes the world is really is in is at risk in many ways yes politically, socially, uh, but also existentially, I think, in many ways. So we need to invite our children to become 
part of the of the of the of the of the understanding what's going on and also part of the the ways to to deal with that not only not only solutions i mean that's that's too easy but i say with say how to deal with the, these challenges and that chapter project goes in that direction uh we work and that's interesting it's a, that's a new new definition that we found out we work intercontextually intercontextually so the contexts are basic we cannot work let me say in a in a detached decontextualized context we need to contextualize yes uh mary has is also in in our midst and she called this the context collapse during the pandemic i like that word very much mary it's a very it's a very nice expression because it really helps us what happened there so we need to overcome those context collapses we need to work based in contexts yes there's another another uh, idea coming from Catherine Turpin is also in, around here. The dignity of praxis and the dignity of context. Yes, so the context has its own dignity. So locally anchored within context, but then intercontextually, how can we bring together the contexts? How can we learn from each other from, the, from those different contexts? Um, and and we found out that during those conversations, which are who are on, which are on Zoom actually. Yeah, and uh, like you said, Mayan, Zoom is nice, but <laughs> the actual encounter uh, Moella had, the learning and encounter in, in the presence of each other is naturally, of course, much, much nicer and much more, um, um, much more um, fruitful, I would say, yes. But still on Zoom, you can you can find each other, you can learn from each other, you can learn intercontextually. I really appreciate the, the possibility that we also found through 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 the through the the pandemic uh, as a challenge so to say and there this this idea arose that we need to focus much more on what we found together as a common concern which is diaspora so so many children are in a situation of diaspora eh? refugees migration uh, experiences but also diaspora within their heads so to say or within their communities or within their small life world so what is what's going on so we organically through working together through this collaborative process we found out that diaspora and displacement yes uh, is is a challenge for many young people yeah, and all over the world so i really believe that this intercontextual zoom related exchange of work on children as participants in theological research can bring us to new insights and can bring us to this idea that we have to focus more and more on, I, I mean, that, that's the organic thing, the organic thing that, that, that pops up out of that sort of process. So that was the, that was the, the second project I would like, I would, would have liked to present to you. Actually, this is what I have been thinking about. So bringing uh, younger scholars to the table of learning, invite them also to cooperate in your learning uh, work as a as a as a full professor or as a as an assistant associate professor, yes, even there, and secondly, uh, invite uh, colleagues internationally to the to the place of learning to the table of learning by by coming together. There are a couple of challenges, but we can discuss them later during the conversation if that is okay for you, Mayan. Thank you for listening. Thank you for for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bert. Uh, once again, please join me in expressing our appreciation for Bert's thoughts there with some sign, either an emoji or visual cue. Thank you. Um, absolutely, some of the themes mentioned so far by our two speakers and the one to follow, we will pick up on as we have fuller conversation later on. Thank you, Bert. Our third speaker, is Dr. Cynthia Cameron. She is the Patrick and Barbara Keenan Chair of Religious Education and Assistant Professor of Religious Education at the University of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto. Her research focuses on adolescents, developmental psychology, and the practices of Catholic religious education. Among her recent work are You Are the Now of God, an article and essay, um, published in the Horizons Journal. Actually, the subtitle is Christus Vivit and the Need for a Theological Anthropology of Youth. And her current collaborative project is titled Nobody's Perfect, Redefining Sin and Mistakes in Adolescent Christian Education, co-edited with Lakeisha Lockhart-Rush and Emily Peck. 
forthcoming from Fortress in the spring of 2025. Be uh, on the lookout for that place. Without further ado, Cindy. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of you for, for coming today and to um, Ruan and Bert for presenting. Um, a couple of quick notes before I start. Um, one is that my experience, unlike Muala and, um, and Bert, my experience is coming very much as a junior scholar. Um, I think Lakeisha, um, Emily, and I were only a year or two out of our doctoral programs when we started this project. And all of our um, collaborating authors were within a couple of years of finishing their um, their doctoral programs. And in fact, one of our collaborating authors finished her doctoral program while she was writing this uh, with us. So um, we are coming at this very much from that perspective of, um, of junior scholars, um, as people new to this field, as people like uh, trying to establish a foothold in the, in the field um, while also doing collaborative work. Um, so I should start by saying here that I'm representing our co-editing team, which is made up of myself, Lakeisha Lockhart and Emily Peck, who I think are in this room as well. Um, and a shout out to Jennifer Moe, who is also an REA um, member, who is both one of our collaborating authors um, and was part of the editing team at the beginning. Um, our team was collaborative from the very start. Um, so while I'm speaking about my experiences of collaboration, um, and I'm hoping that Emily and Lakeisha can echo some of that, um, we did find that collaboration um, was a process of working with not only scholars that we respected, but also with friends, and, and it just turned into such a delightful experience. Um, I'm just going to really quickly share our cover. Um, so this is our book that's coming out from Fortress Press, um, Nobody's Perfect, and these are our collaborating authors. Um, you'll notice that everybody except for Almeida Wright and Patrick Reyes, who I would count as more seasoned scholars, everybody on this list is, um, is a junior scholar. We also have practitioners and people who work in um, in the academy, and we have people who work with graduate students and people who work with undergraduate students. It's a very, um, a very diverse list. So as a collaborative writing experience, this book project grew out of a meeting of the Adolescent Girls and Faith Formation Working Group at the 2018 REA convention. At that meeting, we brainstormed ways of collaborating around questions of adolescent mistake-making and sin. In particular, we wanted to interrogate the ways that Christian theological articulations of sin and mistake were being taught to adolescents and the ways that these failed to guide kids towards knowing the difference between the two. Over the course of the project, we also identified the ways that some kids, particularly those already marginalized because of race, gender, and gender identity, and sexual orientation, we're not allowed to make mistakes in the same way that privileged kids are, and how sometimes these kids are told by ministers that they themselves are the mistake. As the project evolved, these themes came together into an edited volume that tells the story of adolescence and mistakes in a way that we hope will help both scholars and practitioners to accompany kids in their faith formation in healthy ways. So as junior scholars, we especially wanted this book to prioritize other junior scholars and the qualitative research that many of us were doing. We invited members of the Adolescent Girls Working Group and other REA members who focus on ministry with adolescents to propose chapters for a book on adolescence, mistakes, and religious education. We received proposals, we refined the books focused, we lost a few authors, we gained a bunch of, of other ones. Um, we worked through a global pandemic. We refined the focus a little bit more. We worked through the editing process, which was a back and forth of probably about four or five um, times. And we finally had a draft manuscript in the summer of 2022. We started sending it out, sending a proposal out to publishers, and in the spring of 2023, we got a positive response from Fortress Press. 
Yvonne Hawkins, our editor at Fortress, was as enthusiastic as we are about the book. And she really, really helped us to refine the proposal even before she presented it to the publishing team. The book went under contract in the fall of 2023, which kicked off, of course, another round of editing. We are now in production with the book, with the book coming out in early spring of 2025. Let's close this for now. All of which is all of which to say that the process of inviting people into our collaborative project was a bit organic. It started with seeing who was interested and able to participate, and later on soliciting others who could contribute to the overall vision by providing different perspectives, by filling gaps in the book's argument, or by expanding our field of view. In the end, most of our contributors are members of REA, honoring that original think tank experience. We had originally wanted to pursue a collaborative editing process as well, where each chapter, where chapter authors would work in small groups to workshop their chapters, um, taking this idea from um, several collaborative projects in feminist the theology, including a book called Shoulder to Shoulder, edited by Susan Abraham and Elena Percario Poli, and several edited volumes curated by Richard Lanon, Nancy Pineda Madrid, Hosman Espino, Teresa O'Keefe, and Colleen Griffith at BC's School of Theology and Ministry. However, COVID made this very difficult and we decided to use a more traditional editing process. Even so, we were committed to that process being one of conversation and collaboration rather than one of us telling them what to do. This was especially important in working with our authors who are practitioners, for whom the practice of academic writing is not a regular part of their work. In the end, the whole process was one of working together towards a goal of writing something useful for the church and the academy. We had a ton of guidance along the way from more senior scholars, particularly Almeida Wright, who advised us several times along the way and ended up writing a beautiful foreword for us. Um, from Jack Seymour at the very earliest stages when we talked with the Horizons team about publishing with them, and from Dory Baker, who gave us excellent advice in the beginning about thinking creatively about our project. We learned that, um, we learned very quickly that more seasoned scholars are always open to a conversation, a quick touch base, um, a little bit of brainstorming with us, and, and they were unbelievably helpful in our process. While the editing process was collaborative, of course, so too was the process of writing the introduction and conclusion to the book, which were co-authored by the three of us. Particularly for the introduction, which was one of the very first things we wrote, even before many of the chapters came in, we found that the process of co-writing something is very different than writing on your own. It was exciting and generative in that each of us brought different perspectives and expertise to the writing process. We had a shared vision for what we wanted the book in general and the co-authored pieces to do. And that shared vision meant that we, that all, that we all three of us cared very much about these pieces. So we brainstormed together, we read each other's work in the introduction, we refined our arguments, we wrote and rewrote and re-rewrote and re-re-rewrote. And eventually we ended up with pieces that set us with pieces that set us up to tell the compelling story of our book. It was challenging in that we needed to end up with something that spoke from a unified voice. It was also challenging because this kind of writing just takes longer. It was also um, the back and forth of figuring out what we wanted to say and how we wanted to say it takes time and patience and generosity and humility and openness. That said, we found it to be a wonderful experience, both the co-writing and the co-editing. It was thoughtful, interesting, and inspiring work. And Yvonne at Fortress was instrumental in the final stages in helping us to refine the introduction so that really worked as the hook for our book, inviting people into the conversation that would happen over the following chapters. Her advice about what we had to say, what we ought to say, and what we should leave out was so helpful in this collaborative process. 
all of which to say a good ed editor who knows her job is a godsend. And some other things that we learned about writing uh, or about working on edited volumes. On the one hand, they are great collaborative projects and writing chapters for an edited volume is great for junior scholars looking to grow their research agenda and for all scholars looking to try out new ideas in a short format. On the other hand, as an editor, it is a bit like herding cats as we tried to keep our collaborating authors focused on our project and turning things in on time, especially towards the end of the project when timelines were tight and not set by us. We also found that publishers were not always interested in edited volumes that are simply an anthology of chapters on a shared theme. A lot of presses, particularly the smaller and specialized ones in the US market, aren't doing edited volumes as much anymore. I guess there's not as much of a market for them. What we learned from our editor at Fortress is that when they do publish an edited volume, they want the whole book to tell a story, to have a unified theme so that each chapter is contributing to that larger story while also being able to stand on its own, which puts an additional pressure on the project as a collaboration among the editors and the authors, particularly as editors, because we needed to be super clear about what each chapter was trying to do, um, not only so that we could help authors make their chapters as strong as possible, but also so that each chapter worked with the, all the others. So that themes, terminology, and especially important for us, theological commitments were reflected across the whole of the book. But when you get a group of collaborators who are truly passionate about the theme of the book, it is a real grace. Working with others who care deeply about the same things is so wonderfully generative of good theology and good ministry. So many of us spend so much of our time working alone. Both Emily and I are the only people doing religious education at our institutions. Several of our collabor collaborators teach outside of their specialty in undergraduate religious studies courses. And a couple of collaborators are practitioners without the kind of support for scholarship that they might have at a college or university. So the opportunity, opportunity to collaborate on a book, exploring something that we are all passionate about with the chance to share ideas with and receive feedback from like-minded colleagues was wonderful. It's a really great way to work closely with others and to have others care deeply about what you think. We take each other seriously and in the end, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And we hope you'll all buy our book in, in the spring. Okay. Thank you. That's a great word to end on. Thank you so much, Cindy. <laughs> Please join me in sharing our appreciation for Cindy's thoughts through an emoji, your visual sign of some kind. All right, I am tracking our chat box um, carefully as well, but let me invite us to pause here real quick as we let the thoughts and the reflections of our three colleagues um, sink in. We're gonna invite them, three of them, to think about what they'd like to pick up from each other's sharings in a little bit, okay? But also I wanna invite us uh, participants to um, respond in a couple of simple ways as well to get our thinking going. Um, if through through um, a signal through through your your Zoom um, uh, reactions and whatnot, if you could, um, let me turn to gallery view. Um, how many of us in this room have participated in any kind of academic collaboration? Any kind at all? Show a sign. Thumbs up. Okay. All right. I'm asking obvious questions, right? All right. How many of you have participated? Okay, now clear your signs. Okay, a lot of you have participated. I, great. How many of you have participated in failed projects? Projects that really didn't go through at all? Okay. All right, keep them up. All right, let's, let's get real about this, right? <laughs> okay, now clear your signs, okay? How many of you 
have had to consider very carefully about what would count in the collaborative endeavor, whether what it would count for your own work, for your institution, for whatever purposes. How, how, do, how many of you have had to really carefully weigh that decision? Okay, all right, let's be honest, right? Okay, now, how many of you, as a couple of you have reflected in the chat box already, are looking for opportunities to collaborate? whether within REA or beyond. Okay, nobody wants to collaborate. Okay, folks, this is an opportunity, hopefully, um, this is the beginning or the continuation of some of your wondering, right, about resources and encouragement for, for those endeavors. Now, let me turn um, the mic back to our speakers, Moala, Bert, and Cindy, and invite them to briefly connect or just highlight a theme or a thought or two that they had heard from each other. May I first? Uh, yeah, I I, I was uh, interested in Bert's um, remark on uh, contextualization that you care about about the context. So, um, in some of my work, um, I tried to define this like a global thinking because, yeah, we we. Uh, Locality is important, but also the the, the global, the universal important. So, how do you integrate these two, two and uh, how do you make connection between the two while um, creating information or contributing to any project or so? I the balance between the local and the global. And thank yeah. you. Yeah. Just briefly, um, Moala, thank you for for your word "global." I like that word because it's 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 used many times, but I think it's it's the right word here. It's about it's about uh, being um, being fair to the local contexts of the participants, yes, and finding at the same time a common language to understand each other. So that's something we have to deal with in in Europe in many ways because of the languages. Huh? That's that's one of the things that we have to to struggle always. And I like this idea of linguistic hospitality of Paul Ricoeur, the, the French philosopher, who speaks about linguistic hospitality. If we work together, we need to be hosp hospitable to the other linguistically. What do you want to say? What is your point? What do you want to what do, I, what do you want to make clear? I, I like that idea. So you need to find a common language, but also the, the, the local the local languages should be honored in a way. Yes. And and in that respect you can learn so much from each other through through language. Yes. By the way, dear friends, uh, Muella and I were together in the in a proposal for a European project, and it was completely not accepted. So, if you want to be, if you want to make sure that things are going in the in the in the in the opposite direction, that was the case. Yeah, it was a beautiful project, actually, on the on the complexity of classrooms in within Europe. Yes, uh, but we were not we were not successful in with the with the uh, yeah with the situation. Yeah. Just to just yeah. to be sure, that this even on on our level, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a, a point to clarify this project that I invite Bert and other colleagues for this project because you know that last year in February in Turkey we had a dreadful earthquake, and after that we the the scholars tried to do something and I I with a group of scholar um, built a foundation uh, uh, no it's an in, in, initiative it's not a foundation yet but we try to initiative we called resilient classrooms that we want to help the people in the region because thousands of people lost their life lost their um, in, uh, not only their life but their their family their relatives and, and this is really disaster so we wanted to empower the teachers so it was about resilience and well-being together but we um, the, the report is not so bad bad but we need to develop it uh, but we believe in our project we will continue we will try again and again we will try now we, we, we never give up okay thank you um the only thing that i would add is um one of the things that really resonated for me from moala's um presentation was the identification of reflection responsibility and respectfulness as um, characteristics of collaborative work. Um, and um, I think that that's um, 
I mean, that should guide all of the work we do, whether it's writing or not writing. But um, but I found that that to be really helpful, um, particularly for framing what I think about in terms of um, inviting collaborators to be honest about where they're coming from and really self-reflective. Um, and in, as a part of that, the process of identifying what are the things that are non-negotiable, particularly theologically non-negotiable for us, um, and what are the things that we are um, um, where ongoing theological conversation can make can bring us to a richer place, um, and I think that that's that um, that boundary um, is going to change for different people, and obviously in in very different projects as well. Let, let me uh, find a way for us to invite more voices into the conversation, especially as we pay attention to the comments and the questions already being dropped in the chat box. Um, I um, Let me offer um, a, a thread so that we can connect to. Um, there are um, important words that jump out at me in, in, in what Moala Bert and Cindy shared, words such as uh, as Cindy just picked up, reflective, responsible, respectful, power, communal challenge, common concerns, process, from logistical to organic, right, development, care, right? So already our speakers are getting at really the, the deeper, the more profound nature of collaboration as encounters beyond just coming together to write together, right? Parallel play, as we said earlier in the session, collaboration is more than parallel play, but it's harder there, therefore, right? And the politics of that, as some of the comments in the chat box is, is getting at, right? The politics within academic settings. So I wanna invite us, uh, our speakers perhaps to begin with that, but also participants, if you'd like to chime in, especially those of you who've been referenced by name or mentioned by name already as part of the collaborative projects. Interreferencing also is an important politics of empowerment, right? We lift up each other's work by saying that we build our ideas based on each other, uh, right? And not just name dropping, right? Um, for At least for REA and religious education. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat box about how do we start? How do we do this work, especially for so-called junior scholars? I, I I would hope for us to find other ways than labeling ourselves <laughs> in terms of where we stand right, um, uh, within the academy. But um, there's there's a comment I think from Emily Peck about how collaboration sometimes can be part and parcel of an anti-colonial endeavor, especially within the power and the power structures of academia. I wonder if Emily is able to speak to that, if you uh, uh, have the freedom to do so and or um, invite our speakers to address that comment. Yes, Dr. Peck. I can, my kids are at summer camp, although I have not yet showered after my workout. So pretend I look professional. Um, <laughs> thank you. I don't know that I have a whole lot more to say than what I put in there. I just think that it's very easy to get caught up in the um, I need to publish my work thing. And I think especially as educators, the um, I, I think it's part of our work to be working with other people. And especially when it comes to students, I, I am privileged enough to have research uh, assistants as you know, master's students who are research assistants and they want to do research and they want to write and to be able to help them get into that, I feel like is part of my teaching even though it's not my course load. Um, and that's not what I should be doing, right? In terms of getting my career ahead or whatever. Um, but I might be a perpetual visiting professor anyway because of the way that the academy is going and theological education and the lack of tenure track positions and the lack of them getting replaced when someone retires, all of that stuff. Um, and so just kind of uh, recognizing the reality of that and being committed to this kind of teaching of my students allows me to do what I'm not supposed to do because it is what I'm supposed to do. Do our speakers want to respond? 
The only thing that I would add to, to Emily's experience is that as somebody who is on the tenure track, um, one of my frustrations with collaborative projects is they're not as highly valued in my tenure process, right? I am working way harder on this project than I am on any of my solo author um, pieces. Um, and I think that some of my collaborative work is gonna have a greater impact on um, the way in which religious education is is done in the field. Um, but that's not necessarily always reflected in the way things are valued in my tenure process. And I think that that's one of the um, challenges of working in theological education right now is that we're, we don't know, we have such a long history of prioritizing single author pieces that we don't know what to do with collaborative work, um, especially for junior scholars. Um, and I think that that's, um, unfortunate because I think that some of the really good work that's being done is being done collaboratively. So there's a couple of questions. I'm trying to uh, go back to the chat box um, from colleagues who are either outside of academic settings, wondering how to be invited uh, in, or perhaps not even to passively wait to be invited in, but what are the avenues for collaboration when one's outside of a formal um, academic setting? and or how do quote unquote junior scholars approach so-called senior scholars um, to, to venture on a collaboration? Um, would those who dropped those comments want to speak to that before I invite our speakers to address those? No? Okay, Moala, Bert, or Cindy? Yes, if I may, I would I would really um, I would really think that we as as senior scholars, we have a responsibility, and we have a reflexivity, and we have a respect that we need to offer our emerging scholars. I think so. There's something that we need to do. I mean, we can stay and wait, but we need to invite them to be part of our learning circles and, and research circles. I'm very convinced of that. So that's the thing we can do and we should do from, from my perspective. So we let, let us be honest about this. I mean, the, the, it's it's a difficult thing to to get published, to be to get published, even in I mean, also in Europe, it's it's, it's difficult. And there are a lot of um, scientific paradigms going around. And, and if you're not fitting into one of those paradigms, you have a problem. I have personally have a problem sometimes with the fact that I'm not working that much empirically as all my colleagues in religious education are doing these days. I mean, I'm working much more hermeneutically and that makes it difficult for me to get to get published. Yes, even I, yes. But if I bring along scholars and I open up the, scho the scholarly circle uh, around me and invite younger scholars who also find this an important way of, an important avenue of dealing with uh, with religious education research, I can I can make a difference. I think so. That's that's a that's it's not about school uh, school building. I mean school school organization, but it's bring people together. Yes, and and making something happen in a way. But that's 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 our responsibility. I would say yes, as as seniors. Thank you, Bert. Dare I say the impolitic, and that is once upon a time. Some of us may remember the days in which you know, whose names appear on titles of, right, of collaboration matter and the order of, you know, their appearance also matter and subject to a lot of tense conversation, even fights, right? Um, so how how do we have the courage to, to cut against that grain and be encouraged and motivated to do so and to be encouraged to take risks and fail in doing so, right? Um, I see a hand. Um, Dr. Espino, did you want to come in? Yes, uh, thank you, Marianne, and thank you uh, to the panelists. Uh, this is just to get you no know, continue the conversation, more a comment than a than a question. Uh, I want to build up a little bit on uh, what Bert uh, is saying in terms of uh, the responsibility of uh, uh, of those of us, or among those of us who are ahead uh, of the journey, you know, and we have had some privilege already to either get tenure or be more established um, in, in, in our different fields, you know? And uh, so it, it, it comes, uh, you know, it becomes uh, imperative that we are intentional 
no, in creating the spaces, no. But at the same time, we have to be attentive to questions of vulnerability, you know. And this, 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 this is this is this is something that I have experienced in the collaborative projects that I have run, you know. Uh, being as being more senior and war, you know, as a, as a senior scholar working with uh, early career scholars, you not know, requires me to pretty much, you know, sit down on the, you know at the same level as the rest of my colleagues, you know, and listen to what's happening. So there's a, a sense of vulnerability on my on my own part, and I have to embrace it. But I'm also, I'm always mindful about how vulnerable emerging scholars, you know, or junior scholars feel when working with senior scholars. And there have been plenty of cases, you know, in the past when, uh, you know, junior scholars share their scholarship, you know, and they put it forward and so on. But it's the senior scholar, the one who gets the recognition, you know, and and that is not fair, you know. So we we really need to figure out ways for 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 us to uh to do what something like what Birth was saying, you know. If I'm working with doc with doctoral students, or if I'm working with uh, non tenured professors, professors of the practice, or practitioners. How, how do we find ways to honor those uh, those works? But the academy is brutal in many ways. You know, the academy has its own set rules. Uh, publishing in journals has has its own rules and so on. So how do we become countercultural? And that's the vulnerability to which I think uh, I feel we need to be attentive. Thank you, Hasman. I encourage other questions. If you'd like to get into the conversation, please uh, let me know. Uh, by raising your hand digitally. Um, I am looking at our chat box and noting a couple of powerful comments about um, um, the invitation being extended from our early career uh, colleagues uh, to those of us who've been around the block several times to take a risk and to take initiative, right? And, um, and, and not uh, wait to be approached. Um, I appreciate Cheryl Metzger, uh, Metzner's comment, uh, connecting the conversation in this session with the larger theme of the conference, the interdependence and interconnectivity of our endeavors, our scholarly endeavors. Um, does anybody have another question or comment? I'm also noting the fact that Dean Blevins, another past president of the REA, offers some insight about how to um, let me track that comment about how to help others understand the nature uh, of collaborative work and how it might count or might be weighted. Um, so that might be some helpful practical advice. Dean, uh, may I invite you to, to jump into the conversation and, and speak to that? Or if Dean is not available, I also see another comment from Jack Seymour. Um, past chair and co-editor of our Horizons book series, a founding co-editor of the Horizons book series, and his comment about focus and the potential of collaboration. Jack, may I invite you to speak to that? Uh, just a real quick comment. Uh, the uh, first three manuscripts I did were all collaborative, and, and uh, I had to fight uh, uh, at a couple institutions to get them to count. But the argument I made, and I think the thing that we need to think about is focus and so what? When you write a single author book, I've thrown many chapters away because they lost the focus of the book. Mm -hmm. And when you write a book, you have a focus to it and it goes somewhere. It mm -hmm. ends with a so what. Uh, too many collaborative, quote unquote, which I really mean just edited books, are like an article mm -hmm. uh, collected in a journal. And of course, journal articles are great, but they count at one level, which is mm -hmm. a different level than a collaborative work should be. If a collaborative work, I think, this is just a personal opinion, if a collaborative work is a bunch of edited pieces that don't have a clear focus and don't have a so what, they will not have the same kind of impact. 
So uh, in addition to the other words, I just want to underline focus and impact. I see Dean has made an appearance. Did you want to come in <laughs> because I made you? Uh, but I also see a hand. <laughs> uh, would you mute yourself. Somebody has to be the person who has to be reminded. <laughs> I'm um, I'm I'm definitely under Zoom challenge today, so my apologies to everyone. Um, uh, so I'll just say briefly about what I did post was I just wonder at times the way we've worked in the humanities, if that has formed us in a particular way, uh, as opposed to other fields. So I sojourn a lot, and I've noticed in psychological sciences, for instance, a lot of work is uh, collaborative, and definitely in the articles. But it's really sort of helping people know then where where do they fit in that collaboration. So the checklist was just a way of uh, at least one psychological science uh, person I know well known uh, really uses this as a way to help uh, the very people they're bringing into the collaborative work sort of recognize how they would then appear in the publication just based on their contribution. So it's just a it's just a resource. I'm I'll, I will echo uh, part of what Jack said also. Um, having seen some what I call crowdsourced versions of collaboration um, that uh, at times really um, they're empowering in, in a way they re, they basically allow young scholars or practitioners to actually publish something, but then trying to find the overarching uh, trajectory of the, of the writing is really difficult at times. And so that's I think that's always going to be a part of the challenge as we go forward. So I'll, Maureen, I'll turn it over to you and at least try to figure out how to turn off a microphone. So, so. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Maureen, yes, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying the conversation and it, there are so many levels to it. I guess I was just going to add a, sort of a, a plug and a plea for um, besides all the important, if you will, political dimensions that are being raised, and, and I would say the, the kind of Jedi dimensions that are being raised, because a number of these are, are reflected in the, is it the newly adopted Code of Ethics for Jedi? Uh, and if people haven't seen that, I would urge you to look at that uh, with REA. I think we really speak very, very clearly to issues such as as authorship and and uh, the the attentiveness needed to uh, uh, to giving full credit, et cetera, for uh, collaborative works or or uh, differently sourced works. But anyway, um, as I'm listening, uh, what I'm really caught by is. Uh, people who are well experienced with collaborative uh, work would be um, best practices and processes. I'm really interested in the processes of collaborative writing. And um, I'm uh, since the, the Catholic Church has been engaged in this synodal process uh, for the past few years, I think that's something that uh, I'm uh, that I th is going to be interesting to pursue. I've been involved in a co-edited volume for the past couple of years, and part of what we're doing is, uh, besides having individual authors of, of chapters for this book, we're going to have a concluding essay that's going to be a kind of roundtable by uh, invited uh, folks who are not authors of the of the chapters, but they're going to read the chapters and then they're going to gather as a round table and we're going to use a sort of quasi synodal process with them. But we're inviting uh, a junior scholar to draft the essay out of the round table. So there's this whole kind of iterative process in which there are essays happening, but then other people talking about them and then another person getting a chance to do the, the kind of illumination from that that will become the concluding essay. So we're kind of excited about it as a process. So I'm interested for us as religious educators to talk about what collaborative processes in uh, writing could be and to help one another with those, uh, maybe by, I don't know, a website or a, a, a web page on REA that might um, share some of those possibilities together. So. Yes, if I heard you correctly, Maureen, this last bit that you just said is um, finding a space within the REA to name possibilities and resources for us to connect. Um, so perhaps, as I was saying, um, chatting with um, Denise, our tech host on the side here, we're going to drop 
uh, some little links that are shared in the chat box onto the conference Padlet site so that you can go there, you know, follow the links, but also to drop in your interests, right? Your questions, your possibilities for others to connect if they'd like to learn more about your work or to join in your uh, in your project, right? Um, Dr. Fears, Barbara, I see. Okay, maybe my comment uh, follows along that pathway because I was thinking about many of us have a niche per se that we're known for, and yet we can write outside of that. And I'm grateful to um, Dr. Jansen, Dr. Um, Crutchfield, because I was invited to participate in a recent project they have we can write outside our particular uh, area of expertise. And so it was a wonderful collaborative effort and I appreciate that. But if we don't have those personal invitations or if we don't have something comparable to a call, then we end up not being able to participate in collaborative activities. So if we have something like that on the website, like when there, when there are guest journals with a particular theme, then we don't know about those. So if you could add that, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me think of something just to reiterate what you just what I just heard you say, uh, Barbara, that sometimes it feels like based on our CV or our website profiles and whatnot, that we only know two things, right? But right. we know more than that. And the, for, for colleagues to take a chance to say, say, can you do this? Can you write on that? I mean, I, I think back to the number of times that colleagues have just asked me a wild question that then opened an opportunity for me or a new path of research and inquiry. So that's that's another part of collaboration as well. Bert, I see your hand. Do you want to get in? Yes, I want to come back to that issue of, of, the, of the, the junior scholars and, 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 and the people um, working on, on tenure and so on. I also believe, uh, and that relates to what Jack just said a moment ago, Jack Seymour, uh, the, the need of the need for focus. So, and this focus, um, the, the the senior can look uh, can look for people who have a focus, but the the junior needs also to, also to show his or her focus. Yes, and okay, there there are so many ways you can do that too. I mean, through through a weblog, to through through social media through there are so many ways that you can show what you're doing what what, what you're working on uh, and to make yourself recognized so to say seen in a way i think it's important too for 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 seniors to find out who is working on what and with a good uh, you know search on the on the web you, you find people working on things so it's also important to get recognized through through if if you want to write if you want to write as a junior you can also write through through the internet through through the to make yourself seen in a way you know what i mean that that's that's and i think social media is, is one when i was a younger scholar i i was i was writing my dissertation and my professor said to me don't go abroad you need to write your dissertation stay at your working table at your writing table you know that yes and i said no i want to i want to see those people i want to meet those people whom i'm talking about who i'm writing about so I went to the United States to see a couple of them. Yes, I spent all my money <laughs> to, 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 to meet up with them. And I, I just visited them and I wanted to see them. That's the Now these days you can, you, you, don't, you can travel, of course, but you, you do not need to travel. You can travel also virtually and you can show yourself. You can showcase yourself and say, this is my research. Take a look, take a chance on me, so to say. <laughs> if you know what I mean? Yeah, is, is that fair? Um, it's. I think it's important to 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 showcase yourself also as a junior and even as a senior. I mean, we we're we're much too too polite, much too friendly. I think we need to be more ag not aggressive but uh, proactive <laughs> in a way. Yes, no, it's a it's a powerful comment. It, it brings back to uh, uh, many things. Now it brings back to the larger theme of this conference about um, epistemology. How do we hear? Uh, one another, um, one another's intention, um, uh, and Jedi principles that Maureen had referenced. You know, there are many ways in which we, some of us, feel like we're making ourselves heard or known, and yet it's not heard and known um, to to uh, larger audiences. So, how do we help one another to make the so-called translation? Um, I'm noting a couple of comments as we kind of turn towards the end of this session, comments that we, we haven't touched on, sharings, um, best practices shared by REA colleagues. Uh, I want to give a shout out to 
what our journal editor, Joyce Mercer, shared about her um, generative collaboration, which produced really one of the key defining um, works for practical theology, that's conundrums, the collection. Uh, I'm just going to kind of talk in, until if Joyce wants to chime in on that. I want to give shout outs to colleagues who, um, uh, just by name, uh, Unjin, Nick, uh, Maria, I'm sorry, I'm losing track of your name, um, who've been offering comments in the chat box. I want to mention your name just so that we hear. Um, Sierra Marie, sorry. And if you want to chime in, please feel free to do so. Hi, oh, my, um, I can hi. Okay. <laughs> uh, touch base here. Good to be with you all during this session. Um, as I mentioned in my chat comment, uh, a lot of collaboration happened around physical gatherings of times we would find ourselves over a meal or whatever. Hopefully we'll have some of those opportunities sometime in the future, but I think there are ways to do that virtually as well. And and I think our colleague, Bert Robin was really pointing to some of that, um, the importance of, of um, taking initiative around this sort of thing. So, you know, some of it is, um, yeah, this sounds like common sense to me. So if I sound stupid, it's okay. I don't mind sounding stupid, but I just want to put it out there and say it. So when you're in these meetings and someone writes a comment in the chat or makes a comment in the meeting and you're interested in that because it shows a connection, you might follow up with an email to that person, even if you have not met them outside of that Zoom room to say, oh, you're working on this. I'm also working on this. I would really like to chat with you about it, blah, blah, blah. Now, in the process of doing that, you do want to recognize that people in certain uh, institutional situations or in certain moments in their careers have limited uh, amounts of time. And so you want to be respectful of what you're asking of other scholars in a way that allows them then to, um, to meet you where they can, which may not be what you predetermined set out if you're not um, if you're not open to working with their schedules or whatever. So uh, all I'm saying is it's a give and take, but take the initiative. The worst thing that can happen is somebody can say to you, I'm really interested in what you're interested to. I don't have time to chat right now, but let's stay connected. And then you find them at the next meeting and you follow it up again. So um, you know, I have a sign on my on my refrigerator door that says there are no disposable relationships. All right. And I think that's really, really important in collaborative writing and in academic work in general, that we meet one another, we find shared areas of of work. Um, they may not develop for years into a project or a publication, but they're all part of the network of things that go into crafting a, a scholarly career. Thank you so much. So the hallway for this Zoom session is the Padlet site for the conference. So please go there to drop your interest or to check out interests. Um, I'd like to bring the conversation to a tentative close for now by inviting our speakers to share any final words that they might have for us, if they have any. Um, Cindy, Muala, let me start with you too. Sure, I, I'm... Unless Moala, you you haven't. Me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, really, I'm really very happy to be in this conversation. I, I learned a lot from the conversation, from the ideas, from this sharing our perspectives and views on the issues and from the chat. And I thought again, that this is the power of encounter. This is the beauty of encounter. And I, I let, let's continue to value the encounter. This, this will be my last word. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's one, there's one thought from Cindy that uh, of Cindy that I would like to highlight again. You were talking about your your collaborative project, Cindy, in 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 back and forth all the time yes so it's also about patience about time yes don't forget to be patient <laughs> with yourself and with your the ones who you are collaborating with yeah 
Thank you so much, Cindy. Yeah, because collaborating takes way longer. Um, <laughs> The other, the other thing that I've been thinking about, particularly in the second half of our conversation, is about cultivating a professional identity as a collaborator. Um, and I think that that, um, for, for, especially for me, it's somebody at the beginning of, the, of their academic career, um, I really want doctoral students and colleagues to approach me and to, um, and I wanna be able to approach them to engage in these kinds of projects. And um, Joyce had mentioned this in the chat that it's as simple as a conversation over dinner. Um, it's as simple as um, at, at St. Michael's College, we have a, during the summer, we have a weekly writing day where we, where um, uh, members of the faculty and um, doctoral students, just whoever's available, we just gather in a room and write together. And the conversations that we have about what we're working on and what, what we're, um, thinking about, um, um, I think is is really helpful in not only mentoring doctoral students in the ways that we do this, but also um, like setting ourselves up to um, engage in these kinds of collaborative relationships. Thank you so much. That's a great word to end on. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for the way in which you even in simple ways uh, demonstrated respectful engagement with one another, class acts, all three of you, and um, the rest of you in the Zoom room. Let's um, thank one another, thank our speakers, and enjoy the rest of the conference, colleagues.